it's hard to believe that we're almost halfway through Lent, but we're, we're getting there. If you are a person who's been paying attention to world events, things that have been going on in the world and in the church for the last three or four years, you might be tempted to say all hell has broken loose. I mean that literally. But we were warned that if we don't live our lives according to God's plan, that things would get difficult for us. Every Tuesday evening, tens of thousands of priests and religious throughout the world pray the last hour of the office of ours, and that is Compline, or night prayer. And every Tuesday night, we read from the first letter of St. Peter, the following. It's from chapter 5 of the first letter of Peter. All of us who are religious and priests are so familiar with it that I've read this over 2,000 times over the last 40 years or so. St. Peter says, stay sober and alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. Every Tuesday night, priests and religious throughout the world read this reading from Peter. The church has constantly reminded or warned priests and religious throughout history the reality of spiritual warfare. In this reading from St. Peter, there are three very important points that we can make this morning. Number one... The opponent that is trying to kill us is very dangerous. He's described as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Right? He's dangerous. He wants to kill us. He wants to kill us spiritually. He wants to kill us even physically. And then secondly, we are told by St. Peter, never let your guard down. Be sober and alert. Don't get caught up so much in world things that you're not paying attention to what spiritually is happening around you. It can get really dangerous. And then thirdly, how do we conquer our enemy, that dangerous lion? We are told by St. Peter, resist him solid in your faith. Live your faith. Do not compromise. Do not negotiate with the devil. Live your faith, which is truth, and live it in its entirety. I can't help but to think that many times we live in a land of the walking wounded. Sin abounds. Sin wounds us. Sin makes us miserable. And so what is the devil's job in all of this? To make sure that our wounds are foul and festering. He wants to make sure that our wounds don't heal, that they hurt a lot, so he can discourage us in following our Lord. We see the signs of the roaring lion all around us. The great modern prophet, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, once gave a great talk uh, where he was talking about the fifth chapter of the Gospel of St. Mark with the man who was possessed by legion, right? And Bishop Sheen said there are three signs of satanic activity associated with this man, and when you see these signs out in the world, you know that the devil is being active. Those three signs are division, violence, and nudity. All three of those signs are prevalent in today's society. And then when the devil gets us to sin, because he at first he's the great encourager, right? He says, go ahead and do it. Everybody else is doing it. Come on, it feels good. Do it. And then once you do it, he becomes the great discourager. Oh, you piece of trash. There's no hope for you. Just give up give up this Christianity nonsense. There's just no hope for you. 
So it seems like at times we are doing things in the modern world, if you're watching the news and seeing how bad things are getting, that what's being done in the modern world would have made the faces of the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah blush with shame. Because we have the fullness of truth. We have been taught all the truth by Jesus Christ. But when you dare mention these things, people will tell you to be quiet, you bigot. Do you always have to talk about the negative? Why can't you talk about something positive? But as long as we ignore the wounds of the pain that people have, that pain will not go away. We can't just merely wish it away. Oh, we can hide, we can bury our head in the sand, we can run away and keep ourselves blind, we can fill ourselves with as much hedonistic pleasure as we can, we can drown our sorrows with alcohol, drugs, porn, but the misery only increases. It's almost like taking sugar pills to heal cancer. It doesn't work. The cancer only gets worse. Soft peddling the gospel message has had grave consequences in today's society. As one author says, mankind has reached a kind of point of no return. How do you put the cat of alternative marriage back in the bag? How do you put genetic aberrations unleashed into the world back into the test tube? How do you withdraw the poisons and pollution injected into the soil and oceans over the decades? How do you reverse the robot takeover of jobs? How do you turn the weapons of race, the weapons race, into another direction? How do you recover the innocence of billions of souls exposed to hardcore pornography? How do you solve these problems? By hiding our heads in the sand? No. By starting a campaign in positive thinking? No. There's only one correct answer. Drink. Drink living water. The message of today's gospel. In today's gospel reading, we see the Samaritan woman at the well, and she was a mess. She's a hardcore sinner, married five times, and now living with a man who was not her husband. As one author says, the Samaritan woman was an outcast among outcasts. Being a Samaritan, she was an outcast from the Jews who, consum who considered Samaritans to be half-breed Jews, perverting the true religion of Israel. Being a woman with a reputation, having had a string of husbands and living loosely with another man, she was an outcast even from among other women. Good women didn't want to associate with her. That's why she was at the well all alone at high noon. Because all the other women would go to the well to get their water during the coolness of the morning. She had to wait till high noon so that she would be alone and not be embarrassed and tortured by the other woman. What better person could Jesus have chosen to show the world he came for sinners? What better person could he have chosen? And by the way, Jesus doesn't affirm her in her sins, does he? Rather, he actually admonishes her in a very loving way by gently reminding her of the truth. And at first... She's kind of standoffish, isn't she? At first, she's a little sarcastic. She's debating with our Lord at first until he starts sharing some of this knowledge with her. And thanks be to God, she was open to the truth. And that truth started to go into her heart. Only the truth would set this woman free. Only the truth would heal her. So we can talk about maybe four quick lessons that we can receive this morning from today's gospel. The first is, is that God is relentless. 
He's constantly pursuing us. The Samaritan woman thought that she was unlovable. That's the reason why she had five husbands and was working on a sixth man. She felt totally unlovable. But as one author says, oh, the love of Jesus for you is the greatest love story ever told. If you have seriously messed up your life, he awaits to heal you, to be your shepherd and the guardian of your soul. That is why we call the Gospels good news. Maybe we need to get off the blogs more often and read the good news. You know, Scripture doesn't say God is loving. Scripture says that God is love. God is love. St. Catherine of Siena, I know I've said this before, but it's worth mentioning again. St. Catherine of Siena, great mystic and doctor of the church, said that Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, they are drunk with love. They are crazed with love. God can't help himself because love is his essence. He doesn't want to see us go to hell. So he will do anything. He will do anything he can to bring us back into the fold, to go after that one sheep and leave the other 99 back in the pasture. So sometimes love must act in a way to save us from ourselves. Sometimes God even has to give us chastisements. Boy, that word scares people. But yes, God does send us chastisements. Why? He sends them to us to wake us up. And that's why, get ready folks, our good father wants to wake us up chastisements are on their way. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian apologist, said, God shouts in our pain to wake up a dull world. God shouts in our pain to wake up a dull world. In the diary of St. Faustina, we read, and this is Jesus talking to St. Faustina, in which he says, I do not want to punish aching mankind but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my merciful heart. I use punishment when they themselves force me to do so. My hand is reluctant to take hold of the sword of justice. Before the day of justice, I am sending the day of mercy. So we are still in the day of mercy, but the sun is starting to set. We have to wake up, and we have to wake up our loved ones and tell them that the Lord is calling us to drink the water. Secondly, we see in this great story, God's love and mercy are demanding. He didn't just affirm this lady and say, go off and do what you've been doing, and I love you anyway. So the same thing with St. Mary Magdalene, is it not? Did he tell St. Mary Magdalene, straighten out your life and, and, and I'll, I'll love you? Well, what he did say was, I love you first, but go straighten out your life. Straighten out your life. Start to love. That's what you were created for. You were created to be unselfish. You were created to love. Living the faith is not easy street, he's telling her. You have to change your life. And it takes effort. It takes effort. That's why he says you have to pick up your cross daily and come follow me. We have to work at giving up our sins. And you know, love relationships always takes effort from both parties. How many marriages are on the rocks today because one is not making the effort Maybe both of them are not making the effort. And that's one of the signs of division in today's society is the breakdown of the family and of marriage. 
I'm originally from upstate New York, and I'd like to go back and see what, uh, to a news site called News Junkie to see what's going on in northern New York. And I check the obituaries and see if any of my old high school friends have passed away or whatever it is. But sad enough, just this week, I noticed the number of divorces in Jefferson County, a rural county in northern New York. There were 44 divorces just this last month. That's sad. That should be a wake-up call. That should be a wake-up call for all of us. Love takes effort. Why? Because love is sacrificial in nature. It's forgetting about myself and reaching out to the beloved. Thirdly, God's love is divinizing. Yes, God heals our infirmities, but even more so, he invites us into his very life. We become members of his family. He wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. That's why we have the sacraments. We were taught over and over again in the seminary that every time we receive a sacrament, we are having a personal encounter with the living Lord Jesus. What an awesome thing that is. So if you want to build up your relationship with Jesus, if you want to become more of a friend of Jesus, what do you do? You receive the sacraments. For too long, people have been encouraged by priests, unless you have a bunch of moral sins, don't go to confession. That's terrible. That's horrible. That's telling people that you don't want them to have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus in the beautiful sacrament of confession. Our late Holy Father, St. John Paul II, went to confession every day leading up to his death. He knew the importance of it. It wasn't because he was running around committing mortal sins. It's because he was coming closer to the light. And as he got closer to the light, he wanted to be more and more pure. So it's important for us to go to more masses. Let's stop doing the minimum. You know, when it comes to Christian love, we're supposed to give everything we have, right? Uh, what are the two commandments of love? Love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength and love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't say, you know, love God with 80%. Love God with 50%. He said, love God with everything you have. Don't be a minimalist when it comes to Christian love. He's calling us to greatness during these very hard times. And he's going to use us, very weak, sinful, weak instruments, to bring others to Christ. Which brings us to the fourth point. Jesus sends all of us on a mission. He doesn't want us to just keep the faith. He wants us to spread it. You know, to, according to the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the Samaritan woman in this story today does have a name. She has a name. Her name is Saint Fotina. She is a saint of the church. Saint Photina. Photina is the Greek word for light. She is one of the great sinner saints. Her continuing witness brought many people to the Christian faith. We see it already in today's gospel, don't we? She, she brings the town out to see Jesus. You know, she's already talking about it. But it is, it's interesting to note that she was described by the early Christians as being equal to the apostles. The Samaritan woman at the well, married five times. The early Christians called her an equal to the apostles. Why? Because she brought just as many people to Christ as they did. Wow. Jesus wants to use us too. No matter what our talents are, no matter how sinful we have been in our past, he wants to use us too. And let that be our prayer today. St. Fotina suffered martyrdom. 
under the Emperor of Nero. Believe it or not, she was thrown into a dry well, a cistern, where she died. But let's follow her example. No matter what our life has been in the past, let us embrace the truth. Let us have a good self-examination. Let us realize that the weaker we recognize ourselves to be, the more power will be in us because God will give us all the grace we need. He will give us that living water. He will fulfill every one of our needs. And maybe a lot of people will be saved because of us. St. Fotina, pray for us. Thank you.